Hi everyone, today I'm going to be presenting my paper on GasLock, a security corruptibility trade-off resilience logic locking scheme. This work was done while I was a PhD student at the University of Florida in collaboration with Dr. Shaolin Shu at Northeastern University and Professors Mark Tharanpur and Dominic Forte at the University of Florida. Um, so here is an outline for today's talk. In the first part, I will provide an introduction to logic locking as well as the motivations behind it. I will also go over some of the recently proposed logic locking techniques and some of the trade-offs that have been found in them in terms of resistance to various attacks. Uh, I will then provide details on our proposed approach, which is gas, gas lock or cascaded locking that specifically mitigates these attack resiliency trade-offs. I will also explain the various security properties around gas lock, especially around its resistance to various attacks as well as overheads. I will then go into the details of our extension to gas lock termed mirrored gas lock or MCAS that has been specially formulated to mitigate removal attacks at the gate level. Uh, I will then end the talk with our conclusion. As we all know, the semiconductor supply chain today follows a horizontal business model whereby different steps in the integrated circuit production process are scattered throughout the globe. This is especially evident in today's age of system on chips whereby IPs are sourced from multiple third parties, sometimes hundreds of third parties, and fabrication as well as test are also outsourced. While this supply chain has vastly increased in complexity over the past decade, it has also resulted in significant cost reduction and has also allowed each party or design house to focus on their core strengths. At the same time, a global supply chain has also given rise to a number of issues related to integrated circuit security. In terms of foundry and outsourced fabrication, threats such as IP, IC, piracy, and theft, hardware trojans or malicious backdoors, overproduction, uh, these threats could exist. There are also risks associated with various third parties involved in the design process, such as outsourced physical design or DFT service providers. This could give rise to issues such as IP piracy as well as hardware trojans. Finally, once the chip is fabbed, packaged, and shipped to OEMs or customers and is out in the field, there is the risk of reverse engineering, which then leads to issues such as cloning, IP piracy, design exploitation, or tampering. Uh, to counter these IC supply chain threats, logic locking has been proposed as a potential solution. The basic idea behind logic locking is quite simple. It makes the functional behavior of a chip or design dependent on a secret key. Now, this is done by adding keying logic, for example, XOR gates, as shown in the figure here, into the design. So the basic idea is that the design fails to produce the correct input-output behavior unless the correct key is provided to the key gates. Uh, this locking can also be done at various abstractions but it's most commonly done at the gate or netdisk level. Due to the locked behavior of the design, it is assumed that threats such as IP, IC, piracy, overproduction, and other attacks are thwarted, since uh, if you don't have the key, that means the design is not functionally valid. Since logic locking was first introduced, uh, numerous attacks have been proposed against it. The first few attacks included DFT or ATPG-based techniques, to propagate the secret key to observable points of the circuit and thus infer the correct key. Uh, countermeasures for such an attack included careful placement of locking gates in the design to cause interference among key gates. Uh, removal attacks were also proposed in order to identify the key gates or locking logic in the design via structural metrics. Uh, an attacker would subsequently, in a removal attack, remove the locking gates uh, in order to invalidate the obfuscation or locking. To mitigate such attacks, logic resynthesis was proposed as a solution. Uh, so what resynthesis does is it can merge the locking logic with the original design uh, via logic optimization and thus prevent isolating of the locking gates in the design netlist. Um, however, the most effective and notable attack proposed on logic locking uh, so far has been Boolean satisfiability or SAT-based attacks. Uh, in this approach, an unlocked chip is assumed to be available from the open market or from a malicious insider. Scan access to the chip is also assumed to be available. The attacker then uses this unlocked chip as an oracle to infer the correct key. The actual attack proceeds as follows. Uh, an attacker first formulates a MITRE circuit from two wrong key guesses on two copies of the locked circuit. Uh, from this 
formulation, a distinguishing input pattern or dip is obtained, which is then checked against the unlocked circuit or chip to obtain a golden input output response pair. Now this golden input output response pair is then added as a constraint to the initial circuit formula formulation iteratively until no more dips are obtained or distinguishing input patterns are obtained. At this point, what can be concluded is that if no more dips are found, all wrong keys have been ruled out, and usually this happens in only a few iterations. And at the end of the attack, the SAT solver is able to return the correct key. So you're iteratively ruling out pretty much the entire incorrect key space in a few iterations, and the SAT solver is giving you the correct key in just a few iterations. Uh, to counter SAT-based attacks, uh, several specific SAT-resistant countermeasures have also been recently proposed. Uh, the common idea behind most of these approaches is to insert a SAT-resistant logic block into the circuit. Now, what this block basically forces the SAT attack tool to do is to basically apply brute force. That is, the SAT attack tool is forced to apply all possible input patterns to rule out all, all the possible incorrect keys and conversion with the correct key. Now, without this block, what would happen is the attack would only take a few iterations to basically prune out the entire incorrect key space and zoom into the correct key. However, this block basically limits the discriminating ability of SAT attack via these distinguishing input patterns. It limits this capability. As a result, the attack is able to converge on the correct key only after applying brute force. That is, it has to apply all two to the n input patterns to be able to converge on the correct key. Uh, one of the more notable SAT resistant locking techniques that has been proposed is anti-SAT, which was introduced in CHESS 16. Uh, it is also similar to other SAT resistant locking techniques in the sense that a SAT resistant locking block is stitched into the original design netlist. However, the block's functional behavior is quite unique. It uses a pair of complementary logic blocks G and G bar that are added together, uh, with G getting the key KI1 and G bar getting the key KI2. Uh, note that KI1 and KI2 don't actually need to be equal to each other. They just need to be set in such a manner that G and G bar outputs are always going to be equal to each other. Now, this means that the output Y, if you provide the correct key, is always going to be zero. And as a result, the circuit functionality will never be corrupted via the XOR gate that is shown here in red. Uh, SAT resistance of the block is a function of the actual logic that is chosen, chosen to be G and G bar. When the output one count of G, the Boolean function G, is very low, SAT attack resistance is maximized. Uh, this is because it limits the ability of the attack to rule out incorrect keys. Uh, conversely, this also means that the output corruptibility of the circuit is quite low. Um, this means that for most input patterns, the circuit behaves as though it wasn't locked at all. So there is this inherent trade-off in anti-SAT uh, in terms of SAT attack resistance as well as corruptibility. So if you're doing better on one end, uh, example, resisting SAT attacks, you're necessarily doing worse on corruptibility. Um, in, in CHESS 17, uh, we also proposed a new bypass attack against anti-SAT and its variants. Uh, the central idea of bypass attacks is to inject some additional logic, which we call the bypass circuitry, into the locked circuit with anti-SAT. Now, this bypass circuit uh, basically mitigates the output corruptibility from the anti-SAT block. In other words, it identifies incorrect input-output pairs from the circuit, which are expected to be quite limited if SAT attack resistance needs to be guaranteed. Uh, the attack then uses the bypass circuit to correct these input-output pairs, uh, which have been identified to be incorrect, and thus the circuit is unlocked without ever needing the correct key. Uh, with this attack, uh, what we also found that there is an inherent trade-off with regards to SAT versus bypass attack resistance. Um, so if high SAT attack resiliency is to be maintained, uh, this automatically implies that there is going to be a weak bypass attack resistance for the anti-SAT block circuit. Uh, conversely, if we want to ensure strong bypass attack resistance, this necessarily implies that there is a weak SAT resistance with anti-SAT. So we found this trade-off that was sort of inevitable with anti-SAT. 
Um, so in this work, we propose CASLOC as an extension to ANTISAT for specifically combating the various attack resistance trade-offs that we just talked about. Um, so in the paper, we prove that, number one, breaking cast lock with SAT attack requires, at the minimum, brute force through the entire input space. Uh, we also prove that uh, cast lock is resistant to bypass attacks and renders this attack infeasible. Uh, but most importantly, we prove that number one and two, the resistance to SAT attacks as well as bypass attacks, are simultaneously achievable, uh, something which was not possible with anti-SAT assays. Um, as an extension to CAS lock, we also propose MCAS, um, which is a mirrored CAS lock. Um, we specifically propose this to um, extend the resistance of CAS locks to attacks based on removal against white box adversaries. Uh, before going into the details of gas lock and mirrored gas, um, we would like to first talk about what are the high-level objectives for a logic locking scheme and how gas lock and subsequently MCAS can meet them. So the first requirement, obviously, is that the locking scheme should be lightweight so, so that it should result in low area, power, and delay overheads on the design that is intended to be locked. Uh, the second one, obviously, it should be resilient to attacks. More specifically, it should be resistant to SAT attacks, which specifically means uh, the SAT attack algorithm should be forced to perform brute force through the entire input space to resolve the correct key. Uh, secondly, it should also be resistant to bypass attacks, which means uh, for the bypass attack algorithm, it should be infeasible to find these bypass patterns uh, to correct. Um, finally, it should also be resistant to removal attacks, which means the locking logic that has been embedded into the circuit to perform the logic obfuscation of locking should not be readily identifiable and removed from the circuit so that the locking is basically nullified. So these are the uh, high-level objectives for a logic locking scheme that we would strive to meet. Um, so now we'll dive into the actual construction of our proposed cast lock approach. Um, so cast lock itself is quite similar to anti-SAT, but it differs in two aspects. Uh, first, it adopts a cascaded structure in its complementary Boolean functions, G and G bar, as opposed to the tree structure followed in anti-SAT. Uh, later, we will show how the structural difference in construction uh, guarantees some of the security properties of cast lock. Uh, the second aspect is the Boolean functions itself, G and G bar. Uh, in cast lock, we vary the output one count of the G and G bar logic by varying the proportion of AND and OR gates. Uh, what remains the same as anti sat however, is the input itself to the G and G bar blocks. In both anti sat and cast lock, uh, the XOR of the inputs with the key is fed into G and G bar. Uh, note here that mixing or using a mix of XORs and XNORs uh, can and should be used, and the circuit should be resynthesized afterwards so that an attacker won't be able to simply decode the correct key by observing the XOR or XNOR gates in the cast lock block. Uh, this was a requirement for anti-SAT, and it is also a requirement that holds true for cast lock. Uh, so now we will elaborate on some of the security properties of cast lock. Uh, we'll start with lemma one, which specifically has to do with proving the SAT resistance of cast lock under any arbitrary con uh, construction of the Boolean functions G cas and G bar cas. Now, by arbitrary, I mean in the cascade of gates that are present in the Boolean function G cas and G bar cas, you can vary the AND and OR in the cascade to vary the output corruptibility, but regardless of which construction of AND and ORs you choose, you will be able to prove that gas lock maintains um, maximum SAT resistance regardless of the construction. Uh, to put it an, in another way, that means if SAT attack was conducted on gas lock, uh, 
the attack would be forced to go through all possible input patterns, that is all two to the n of them, to be able to rule out all incorrect keys. So basically SAT attacks would be reduced to brute force attacks. Um, so now we will lay out a proof sketch for the SAT attack resistance security property from Lemma 1. Uh, for this proof sketch, let's assume that we have the truth table for the Boolean function GCAS and GBARCAS as shown here in the figure below. Uh, in this figure, or truth table, we have the input patterns arranged in ascending order. Now let's assume that the output one count, which is the number of input patterns that lead to GCAS is equal to one. Let's assume that the number of such patterns is arbitrary. Uh, in other words, you can think of it as the height of this column highlighted in yellow, uh, this column of ones, you can think of that as being any arbitrary height. Uh, in such an ordered truth table, we will always have the smallest input pattern, let's call this Lmin, for which GCAS is equal to one. Uh, now let's assume that a wrong key composed of WK1J and WK2J, which jointly result in the wrong key WKJ, uh, this wrong key goes into cast lock. Now recall that cast lock again has two portions, GCAS and GBARCAS. You can think of as WK1J going into GCAS and WK2J going into GBARCAS. And jointly, these two keys form WKJ. Now let's assume that the hamming distance of such a wrong key is as shown here. Uh, that is WK2J, the key going into G bar cast, is only different by a LSP or least significant bit from the correct key. Now for such a wrong key, what effectively ends up happening is that G bar cast, the output from G bar cast, uh, effectively gets pairwise flipped as shown in the truth table. Uh, and now at the input pattern Lmin and only Lmin, we observe that both GCAS and GBARCAS is equal to one. Uh, you can see that highlighted in yellow here. Uh, what this basically means is for this input pattern and only this input pattern with, with a wrong key WKJ, we get the output is equal to one, which means cast lock is effectively flipping the output bit of the logic circuit and corrupting the input pattern for only Lmin and no other input pattern. So for any SAT attack, the only way to eliminate the wrong key WKJ is to apply the distinguishing input pattern Lmin and no other pattern. Uh, note that no other input pattern is able to rule out this wrong key. It is only Lmin that can do this. Now further, since there are two to the n such wrong keys uh, of, the, of the type of WKJ, we can now say that there are actually two to the n unique patterns that are required for the SAT attack to prune out all the wrong keys and guarantee a correct key. Now this effectively proves that the SAT attack algorithm will be reduced to brute force. Uh, regardless of the output one count of GCAS or GBARCAS, since a key such as WKJ is always guaranteed to exist, and these unique input patterns in the form of Lmin are always guaranteed to exist, regardless of the output corruptibility that we've composed in GCAS or GBARCAS. Um, so uh, through the proof sketch, uh, we showed how for any arbitrary construction of GCAS and GBARCAS, uh, we are able to achieve best case SAT resistance, that is the SAT attack will require at least two of the n iterations. Um, we also made an attempt at evaluating this experimentally by generating some sample anti-SAT as well as gas lock uh, gate level net lists and using the SAT attack platform to test them out. Uh, what you can see in this chart over here is that for gas lock, Regardless of the output corruptibility or p-value, you can see that the number of SAT iterations is always maximum. Now, by maximum, I mean n is equal to 8. That means uh, the number of inputs going to the cast lock block for this particular example was n equals to 8. So the number of iterations is always through the bar 8, which is what we have over here. 
Uh, whereas for anti-SAT, which follows the tree structure, we can see that um, depending on the p-value, the SAT attack iterations, the number of iterations required can vary. And we see that the number of SAT iterations is maximized only when p is extremely low or extremely high. Now recall that even though the SAT attack iterations is high, this also means high vulnerability to bypass attacks at these corners. So there is this inherent trade-off that you see in anti-SAT, but for cast lock, you can see that SAT attack iterations are always maximized regardless of the p-value. Um, the second security property of cast lock is output corruptibility, uh, which can be varied by tuning the output one count of the Boolean functions GCAS and GBAR CAS and this can be done without any loss in SAT attack resistance as we just showed uh, previously. The third property um, relates to bypass attack resistance. Um, to ensure this, uh, what CASLOCK does is it prevents the bypass attack algorithm from finding distinguishing input patterns or dips to bypass. Um, the ability of the bypass attack to find these dip patterns uh, distinguishing input patterns uh, via the MITRE circuit shown here on the right. So this ability is drastically decreased as the p-value or output corruptibility of the cast lock circuit is increased as shown by the expression here. So from a defender's perspective, he or she may choose to increase the corruptibility of the design to thwart bypass attacks, while at the same time guaranteeing best case SAT attack resistance, which was not previously possible with anti-SAT. We can also look at the security properties of cast lock under two models. One is under a black box attack model and the other one is through a white box. Black box attacks include attacks such as SAT and bypass, which was the focus of cast lock. In such an attack, an attacker only uh, analyzes the locked circuit via input output patterns or its functional behavior. This might be the case of a reverse engineer trying to break the design in the field. On the other hand, white box attacks include capabilities of the attacker to perform full structure ana structural analysis of the design, uh, including netlist analysis. Now, this gives them the opportunity to analyze the netlist and look for specific locking implementations to remove. Uh, of course, uh, as we said earlier in the talk, um, resynthesis does provide a degree of protection against such attacks, and so does additional XOR or XNOR-based locking on top of cast lock. However, we found that uh, such hybrid attack uh, locking techniques do not really hold up against a particular modified version of the SAT attacks that are known as AppSAT. Um, AppSAT attacks are an extension to the baseline SAT attacks uh, with a subtle difference. Uh, so in each iteration of the attack, instead of adding one golden input output pattern, the attack adds n such IO patterns obtained from the distinguishing input pattern and the unlock chip. Uh, this, in essence, increases the circuit formulation size, but also helps to rule out a larger portion of the incorrect key space. Uh, there is also a parameter set such that the attack, instead of trying to converge on the 100% correct key, terminates with an approximately correct key that guarantees low output corruptibility, and in some cases, even the correct key. Um, now, coming back to cast lock, when we insert additional XOR, XNOR gates, uh, to prevent removal attacks, what ends up happening is an expanded key space is created, with some of it having low output corruptibility and some of it having high output corruptibility, as shown in this root table, uh, where the red marked outputs uh, represent incorrect outputs. Now, when AppSat adds multiple golden input output patterns as constraints in every single iteration, these help to rule out not only keys in the high corruptibility space, but also in the low corruptibility space. As a result, it is more likely, but of course not guaranteed that trying to prevent removal attack actually hurts your ability to resist AppSat attacks. Um, so what we've established is uh, in order to prevent removal attacks under a white box attack model, it is clear that uh, additional XOR or XNOR insertion is not enough. So what we've come up with instead is an extension to cast lock called uh, mirrored cast lock or MCAS. The idea behind this simple extension um, is that we have two mirrored copies of cast lock stitched into the original circuit netlist uh, instead of just one, uh, with one having a hard-coded secret key case secret, so it's hard-coded, and the other one having the actual secret key driven from the outside, which is KCAS. 
Now, after inserting these two blocks, the circuit is, re is resynthesized in order to embed case secret into the netlist itself. Uh, what now happens is if an attack attempts to remove the cast lock block with the key kcast driven from outside, the cast lock block with the secret key k secret, which is merged into the original design after resynthesis, that still remains in the netlist. So correct functionality of the circuit is only guaranteed when the key k cast is equal or set equal to the secret key k secret, which is embedded inside the netlist. Uh, without doing this, the circuit functionality remains corrupted as a result of the cast log block with key secret, which is embedded into the original design. Uh, so MCAS is able to protect cast lock against white box attacks, such as removal. Um, now, unfortunately, this countermeasure is not without its drawbacks. Um, most notably, what happens with MCAS is if you try to increase the corruptibility of the locking, it results uh, inevitably in reduced SAT attack resistance. Now, this happens mainly because the original circuit's output is corrupted on a certain number of input patterns. This is because of the embedded cast lock block with case secret. Uh, if the SAT attack algorithm by any chance finds any of these patterns, uh, such as the ones highlighted in blue in this root table shown, it is able to arrive at the correct key in a single iteration. Now, of course, this is probabilistic from the perspective of the SAT attack, but unfortunately, the probability of success of the SAT attack increases as you keep bringing the output corruptibility of the circuit up. Now, this brings us back to the trade-off between SAT attack and corruptibility, which we talked about at the beginning, uh, but in the context of white box attacks. So uh, this table uh, briefly summarizes the security properties of MCAS. Uh, SAT attack resistance uh, now, of course, depends on the output corruptibility of the circuit, which in turn is determined by the output one count B, as well as the choice of the secret key case secret embedded into the original netlist. Uh, these two factors also determine the output corruptibility of the circuit, of course. Um, AppSat attack resistance is ensured as the attack has no guarantees of terminating with a correct or almost correct key. Uh, removal attack resistance is ensured due to the gas lock block embedded into the original circuit with key secret, as we explained previously. And finally, bypass attack resistance is inherited from gas lock. Um, so we also evaluated MCAS against another recently proposed removal attack resistance logic locking technique uh, that is known as SFLL or strict functionality logic locking. So uh, we did a series of results on a few benchmarks and we found that in terms of overhead, area delay and power, uh, we do better than SFLL and offer the same severe security guarantees. Uh, but of course, uh, at the end of the day, both techniques still have the trade-off of corruptibility versus SAT resistance um, under a white box attack model. So the designer has to carefully analyze this trade-off and will have to implement the locking accordingly. So this table briefly summarizes the various logic locking techniques that have been proposed recently and their resistance to various attacks. Uh, we can see that cast lock defends against SAT and bypass attacks. Uh, but is vulnerable to removal under a white box attack model. Uh, to counter this, we have proposed MCAS, which prevents removal attack, but at the same time, trade off SAT attack resistance with output corruptibility. Uh, this is the same case with SFLL. Uh, however, it has been found vulnerable to a recently proposed fall attack that specifically attacks its mode of implementation. Uh, we've seen that this fall attack does not apply to MCAS. In conclusion, gas lock provides a low overhead logic locking solution, which is simultaneously resistant to SAT and bypass attacks, uh, unlike anti-SAT. Uh, it can maintain non-trivial output corruptibility and remain secure under a black box attack model. Um, to prevent removal attacks, we've proposed mirrored gas lock or MCAS, which remains secure under a white box attack model, but at the cost of SAT attack resistance which is traded off with, of course, output corruptibility.